Hello. Um, this is the time I'm living figuratively where I usually drop in my little um, 1960s TV references. And uh, But today um, I'm going to tell you about other TV that I watched in the 1960s that was not just uh, sitcoms. In the 1960s, growing up in our house, uh, we always had to have dinner probably about, about 4.30, 4.45 or so. Uh, so that we would be done in time for the six o'clock news. There was only one TV in the house and we all had to be sitting down in front of the six o'clock news by six o'clock. It started off with the Cleveland news, the local news, and then it, um, 6.30 came and then it was Walsh and Cronkite. And it was, it was like clockwork. And that was what we did. That was, that was how, how we did it. Um, usually the six o'clock news was old white men talking to other old white men and I didn't really get what was going on. I was only six years old at the time and it just kind of droned on blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it was like a time when I wasn't paying too, too much attention, but it was the TV, so I was, you know, still there. Um, but one of the things that we saw in the six o'clock news that was more scary, uh, you know, and that was, that was real was that we got a front seat to the uh, Vietnam War. We, the Vietnam War came into everybody's living room during the 1960s. Every night they had this black and white footage. It was, it was guns, it was helicopters, it was things blowing up. It was, it was real. And um, as a child who grew up with a lot of television, I knew the difference between the reality and the and movie war and this was and this was real um i feel that uh the vietnam war was kind of the war that gave wars a bad name which is a good thing wars shouldn't have a good name uh because we got to see it you know in our homes and um because this war was so you know was so real and in our laps instead of sort of this remote abstract rah 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 concept that um other wars had been um you know from the safety of of being stateside it uh, it ignited all these protests and um one of the other things that we got to see on the six o'clock news were the war protests where college campuses and cities had lots and lots of young people, the boomers that, you know, are in their 70s, 80s, you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s right now, um, were protesting against the war. Also because the draft was instigated and that was what they, you know, obviously nobody, many, pe many people did not want to go to war and um, they didn't feel that we should be there, so they protested the draft. They were literally protesting for to save their own lives and to save the lives of their friends, which is exactly the type of protesting that is going on, that is going on today. And um, and it's you know it, it's what it's it's history repeating itself essentially in different ways, different flavors. But it's the kind of thing that um, that brings about great change, even though. What we saw, what we saw on the news from the protests and from the Vietnam War, we saw these little snippets of reality, and um, with the protests, it seemed like whenever you saw the uh, the snippets on the news, it was always these this big violent mess, like you know people throwing things and and um, that's that's what you remember from these little snippets of it, but just like television back then showed us these little snippets. The internet shows us little snippets of news right now. And um, it looks like a big gigantic mess. When in fact, when you analyze larger things and look at, at you know, histories and motivations and people and the, the actual situations, um, there's, there, there's just way more of a story than the, the little tiny, uh, you know, the little tiny snippets, because any kind of protest is, it's basically a walking powder keg where anybody that perceives anything 
that happens from the other side as an act of aggression might react to it and then, you know, all heck breaks, breaks loose and, you know, it becomes, it becomes destructive and, and violent. Um, so essentially, that brings me to the reason why we're here in this show here is because we need art and culture and literature and movies and plays and music and books and art especially um, because these kinds of cultural engagement make you, they force you to engage and to slow down and look at something and figure out what the solutions are instead of knee-jerk reactions to them and to figure out ways that we can fix things together. Um, so that leads me to the intro for Living Figuratively. Welcome to Living Figuratively with your host, Judy Takas, me. Uh, this is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Each week, I will be spotlighting a different piece from my collection or from my own work and talking to you about it so that you can learn to live with it, love it, and fill your home and life with figurative art. Um, the two pieces that I have behind me up here on the wall are both from my uh, Solon Senior Project where I went to our hometown senior center and had a different senior pose for me each week. Um, it was, I touched on it uh, last week when I showed you the, the one from the, uh, the laundry room, the judge, jury, and executioner. And as the project went on, I kept meeting new and newer interesting people. Both of these, both of these gentlemen uh, were in their 70s when they posed for me. Leo at the top um, was, he, he had this quiet, contemplative way of talking. He had, was a Japanese-American person who had lived through, you know, he was in his 70s, he had lived through uh, the time period where pe Japanese people were being gathered up and taken to internment camps during the Second World War. He did not talk about that, though, and I didn't ask him. I don't, like, try to, you know, psychologically probe people. I just kind of hope that, you know, interesting things will emerge, but I do did let the seniors talk about what they wanted to talk about. And he basically, Leo told me about the accomplishments of his children and his grandchildren with his very quiet, dignified pride. And um, Paul, over here, who also posed for the senior center, also in his 70s, black man living in the United States, I believe it was Cleveland his whole life, also had seen many, many things, all kinds of you know racial injustice that you see over the past 70 years. Um, but he also did not focus on that kind of, you know, that kind of stuff when he was talking to me. And he, the most recent activism that he had told me about was when he worked with city leaders and so, and residents of our town to build this very senior center that we were, that, uh, I was, you know, having the painting sessions in. And, um, he was very proud of that. And it was a, it's a beautiful senior center and he was a, you know, a delightful, delightful person to paint. So that was really, you know, really very joyous. Um, now I'm going to take you around the corner because the whole show today is called Turning a Corner. And I'm gonna take you to around the corner to the other side where, um, corner right here, I started out with this I'm going to introduce you to this this gorgeous little table that I found at an antique place. It was shaped like a wooden table should be, but it's actually made out of metal. I didn't know where I was going to put it or anything when I bought it, but I thought, you know, this is something that and so I came came home, brought it, found a place for it, and this isn't necessarily the ultimate place for it, but I think it's pretty darn good. It's been here for a while. Um, I set up this little this little area with a couple overflow dining room chairs 
because you know how like you might have more dining room chairs than you actually want sitting at the table. And I set up this table with books and these are not like stage books. These are the actual books that I had sitting here because they are kind of on the on deck circle, like which one am I gonna pick and read next? Um, and you know, I do read books without pictures in them too. So, and there's a chick. Up here is this, you know, dried flower arrangement that I had thrown together with, you know, dried roses and then these wispy tendrils, which made perfect friends with the, the piece of art that I have here by Jamie Zentz, it's called Phoenix. And because it's such a good friend, this is going to take a back seat right now since we're talking about the art and not about the flowers. Jamie Zentz, who is the artist who did this, this beautiful, beautiful piece, um, she is a Cleveland Institute of Art graduate. I first met her at the uh, Fairmount Art Show years ago. We were both in the show, and I believe she had one best of show that year, if not maybe the year after that. But um, when I first met her and heard that she was a Cleveland Institute of Art graduate like myself, um, my first question to her was, how did she get away with drawing the way she draws there? And you can zoom in a little bit on how gorgeous the drawing quality is. Uh, she has this, just this sensuous, beautiful drawing quality, terrific, terrific draftsmanship. To me, it reminds me a lot of like a Alphonse Mucha, Aubrey Beardsley. Um, it just has this, you know, incredible, incredible, pre-Raphaelite line quality to it. And a lot of times art schools, especially the one that I graduated from, um, will beat the beauty out of you. They don't, you know, they want you to be more raw. They want you to be more exposed and, you know, that kind of thing. And that's only one way to, to approach it. Um, I love the beauty of how she approaches, approaches her work. She's super... She's very, she's got this very soft-spoken, peaceful demeanor to her. And, um, so what, and so I figure sometimes having the soft-spoken, peaceful demeanor is a great cover for getting away with doing exactly what you want, which is exactly what she did. Um, at the Institute, they, they let her, they let her do what she did without trying to, you know, make it more raw and visceral and, and maybe not so well drawn. Um, and basically, one of the things that uh, she told me about her method and her process, which I thought was fascinating, is that she takes the, it's a birch, birch board that she sands like super how the composition goes. Um, it's where, where, you know, she might find more empty areas and that would be where you know, the face goes, she might find areas that are more complex and maybe that's where the hair goes. She might find beautiful areas that should be exposed and those are, those stay empty. Uh, one of her interviews, she said something interesting where um, she doesn't like uh, all white canvas because she doesn't want to impose her will upon it. She likes the play back and forth of having the lines there and then she kind of works with that and sort of like integrating with nature instead of forcing your will upon, you know, upon the, the blank canvas. So it, I just love, love, love this piece. Uh, it was part of a show curated by um, Mary Urbis, who is the uh, gallery director at the Lakeland Community College. And she's the mastermind behind the, um, the new May show, which has been around now for 10 years. And, um, and so when I saw this, I bought this piece from the Valley Art Center, which is a, um, an art center. And art center shows are terrific places to find amazing art to look at it and to, you know, and to also bring it home, which is exactly what I did with this beauty. One of the, I'm going to close with one of the most interesting aspects of this, which I didn't really realize or remember. Um, when I went to sort of research this, this uh, drawing a little bit, because I was gonna be talking about it in this show, I, it reminded me that the name of it was Phoenix, which 
Uh, for those that don't know Greek mythology, uh, or I don't even know if it's Greek mythology, but anyway, in mythology, the phoenix is this bird lion creature that get, gets burned and rises from the ashes better than ever and better than before. And um, I thought it was very appropriate, you know, I didn't even plan it that way, but this, this week, with all the different events that have been going on, I think the concept of the metaphorical concept of rising from the ashes um, is a good one because when I think of the, the, the phoenix rising metaphorically, it would be rising with peace, love, understanding, and justice from the ashes of this past week, this past couple months, this past decade, this past century, this past, you, you know, millennia. Um, so it, I'm going to leave this with a, you know, positive, optimistic, hopeful message for the future. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining me tonight on Living Figuratively. Be sure to tune in next week where the uh, episode is going to be Love Athena the homecoming and the Love Athena triptych is um, the major work that is, bridges the gap between Chicks with Balls and My Goddess Project and it's been on lockdown now for the past couple months in Zanesville, Ohio as part of my Zanesville Museum of Art show that has also been on lockdown but it's coming home and I'm going to be talking about it and the influences behind it and the, my different inspiration and the symbolism and just going whole hog with Love Athena next week. Um, living figuratively, same bad time, same bad channel, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next Thursday night. And uh, y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>